I'm now back home, and there's 45 minutes till market close, so I figure we'll watch the rest of it, because that's all I'm going to do anyways. Watch a little bit of news on the side, maybe go outside and listen to some music. We'll see what happens. <laughs> that was a good one. Grocery list and GameStop are the two number one things on Stimmy was the guy's joke. But it's probably not even a joke. Oh man, that's funny. They're so angry about it, that's why it's funny. Guacamole. And those costs that not all of our competitors have the same incremental cost. So for us, 
us. We think it's really important for politicians not to pick the winners and losers. Ronnie, I guess with that tight margin in, in mind, as we, as we look at all sorts of commodities uh, prices rising pretty significantly uh, over the last few months, are you expecting food prices uh, till checkout prices to rise quite a lot later this year? Yeah, if you look at uh, from the whole year, we expect them to be at one to two percent, which is a pretty normal number. Now, if you look at within the year, there's going to be huge variance in the month. Uh, if you look at This year, we would expect uh, to have pretty uh, large deflation. So we have a 2% estimate, uh, but it will be very bumpy along the way. Just to circle back on the Euro pay thing again, Rodney, because LA County just passed it yesterday. So does that mean we're going to see more grocery stores in the area? decisions yet and uh, we'll look at uh, that market and look at uh, where our stores stand and make that decision at that point in time. Your union says that you're just doing this to intimidate other governments not rules. How do you respond? Yeah, we're absolutely not doing it to intimidate. What we're doing is really what I said before, you know, we, we operate in a business that's razor thin. I get fuel.
might end up paying off to stay patient and stay the course, and so no risky bets. You want to create sustainable investment opportunities that we're building wealth for the long run, not only ourselves, but also our families and generations to come. Tip charge of your financial wellness at cnbc.com slash invest in you. We got 2.5 percent on the Nasdaq, uh, approaching 2 percent on the S&P. The Dow's down 1.5 percent as we slide again a little bit uh, after a reasonable afternoon bounce the last half an hour or so, as you can see, uh, sliding towards uh, the close. Uh, let's bring in Victoria Fernandez, Chief Market Strategist at Crossmark Global Ooh. Investments. Victoria, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Are you more uh, are you more likely to top up on on these pullback days or, or sit on the sidelines until uh, until it's all shaken out? Yeah, well, we actually like these pullbacks, Wilfred, as an opportunity to what we call kind of upgrade our portfolio. So we have a wish list of names that we've been looking at, and we're using these pullbacks as opportunities to go in and get some of these names. NVIDIA is a name that we added to our portfolio recently, and we think even though there's this rotation going on from growth to value for longer-term investors, which are what our clients are, then there's an opportunity here to get some of these growth names at prices that are 17, 18, 19 percent off of their recent highs and add them into your portfolio. So NVIDIA is one of them, Victoria. What, what have been uh, a couple of the other uh, key names that you've been adding to in the last couple of weeks rather than selling? Yeah, so over the last month or so, probably, we've been adding some names. And names would be like ServiceNow. Names would be like Nextera within the energy space. Um, we like Apple. We like Amazon. These are all names that we still hold. Microsoft is one of our largest holdings in our portfolio. And all of these names have had tremendous pullbacks. So use it as an opportunity to just start a position or add to your current position in order to take advantage of their growth opportunities over the next year. Obviously, we've been debating a lot what uh, Chair Powell said earlier and, uh, and what rates have done with the 10 years. Growth opportunities. To, to uh, are those numbers <laughs> that concern you more broadly for your equity holdings, or, or, or are they at least uh, not, not rising too fast to make you uh, sell, sell holdings broadly? Well, it was definitely a quick move to get to this point from where we were in the fourth quarter. Jimmy, I need you at 200, bro. That move that had a lot of people concerned. The actual level of I really need you at a thousand. Let's go.
The center of the action today near the room higher after Fed Chair Jay Powell's comments this afternoon. Ten-year yield spiked back above 150. It's 154 right now. 161 was the high of last week. Heading north, that's weighing on technology and the broader market. We'll be right back. The Bond Report is brought to you by PIMCO, a global leader in active fixed income. FlexShares ETFs are built with advanced modeling to fill portfolio gaps and target specific goals, strengthening client confidence in you. For investing, consider the fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses. Go to FlexShares.com for perspectives containing this information. Read it carefully. We are on a mission to make the United States of America the safest country in the world. It is an audacious goal. But since when in our country do we shy away from what is hard, what is difficult, is impossible. We are Americans. The world is going to change more in the next 10 years than the last 100 years combined. Because we, together, are going to change it. We all want to feel safe in the places we spend our time. Restaurants, theaters, stores, hotels, stadiums, offices, banks, child care centers, and schools. I'm Dr. Richard Carmona. This is the Wealth Health Safety Seal from the International Wealth Building Institute, the global authority on healthy buildings. When you see the Wealth Health Safety Seal, it means health and safety measures have met rigorous scientific standards. So look for the Wealth Health Safety Seal outside and feel more confident going inside. Mr. Wonderful here. It's hard for everyday people to get access to startup investments. But with Start Engine, you can choose between hundreds of startups to build your portfolio. It's your turn to shock. Visit StarEngine.com today. Tonight, vaccines ramp up across the country. Some centers running 24 hours a day. Plus, one town experimented with free income. How'd that go? The best. So, a guy named George Day founded GT's Living Foods. Now, renewal by Anderson's 31 day sale is happening at the perfect time before March 31st. Save $300 on windows, save $825 on patio doors, save $825 on entry doors, and get an extra 3% discount when you pay for your whole project with cash or check. These days, it's hard to get a good contractor to even call you back. We're the replacement window division of Anderson. Know that we're here to help you now, and we'll take care of everything for you during our sale. Save $300 on windows, save $825 on patio doors and entry doors, get an extra 3% discount, or pay nothing for a year. Renewal by Anderson's 31-day sale ends March 31st. For a safe appointment during this tremendous sale, call 602-899-9898. Fed's left of trading another down day on Wall Street, and most of the selling technology down another 2.1%. Materials also at the bottom of the pack, consumer discretionary and industrials, all the worst performing groups. The two green spots in the market, energy sector, that one is up 2.2% after an OPEC decision to keep output intact, helping oil prices and all of those energy names. Communication services also coming back as we've seen some of the names like Facebook higher on the session. But overall a down day, more than 1% decline across all the major averages, 2% on the NASDAQ, almost 3% for small cap as we head into the final half hour of trade. Up next, the chief strategist at Nuveen tells us what she's buying amid the sell-off. And check out Bitcoin as we had a break. Not immune from the sell And check out Bitcoin, retards. <laughs> Nobody cares about Bitcoin. <clears throat> Successful real estate agents in America that will sell your home for as little as a 2% commission. The icing on the cake with the ideal agent was that we say $12,000 in commission. We would definitely use ideal agent again. They, 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 the whole process was so positive for us. Excellent, excellent service. Getting right to the point of hiring an ideal agent, I wish we would have done that sooner. And we would have saved six months of, you know, of time and mortgage payments that would have probably never happened if we would have just gone with it first.
first. They were so stress-free. The whole process was amazing, and I would definitely recommend them. We certainly recommend Ideal Legion now to all of our family, all of our friends. It's just a great experience. We are not a discount brokerage. These are top local agents that will get you the best results. Sleep soundly tonight from the brand that more families trust for quality and timeless protection, ADT. Ever since they cut the cord, all Julian's home watch is an endless buffering wheel. Not exactly binge worthy. Now that they switch to Dish, they get a tried, true, reliable experience. Dish, tuned in to you. I got a good, good, a good feeling. Feeling in my bones, gotta shake it out. insurance policy you no longer need now you can sell your policy even a term policy for an immediate cash payment call coventry direct to learn more we thought we had planned carefully for our retirement but we quickly realized we needed a way to supplement our income our friends sold their policy to help pay their medical bills and that got me thinking maybe selling our policy could help with our retirement i was skeptical so i did some research and called coventry direct they explained life insurance is a valuable asset that can be sold we learned we could sell all of our policy or keep part of it with no future payments. Who knew? We sold our policy. Now we can relax and enjoy our retirement as we had planned. If you have $100,000 or more of life insurance, you may qualify to sell your policy. Don't cancel or let your policy lapse without finding out what it's worth. Visit CoventryDirect.com to find out if your policy qualifies or call 1-800-519-0500. Coventry Direct, redefining insurance. The market for both luxury real estate buyers and sellers showing signs of a rebound. Here are a couple that we wanted to show you. Grinder founder Joel Sinkai snatched up this 7,000 square foot penthouse on East 19th Street for a cool $30 million. And down in Florida, Eric and Don Trump Jr. just listed an oceanfront Palm Beach mansion for 49 million dollars they just bought it a couple of years ago for something like 18 million and as more celebrities are listing their homes we figured who better to bring in than the star of million dollar listing new york real estate mogul and author ryan serhant ryan you got to tell us what's going on here and not just the uber high luxury real estate but sort of the lower end luxury real estate and whether the best prices are already in the rearview mirror Look at gold. Look at Bitcoin. There is a hedge against traditional uh, traditional equities, traditional assets, and we're seeing a lot of that right now in real estate. For the first time since I think 2006, we are now seeing clients say to us as, as brokers, uh, I, just, I just need to put my money into real estate. I have never had that in my entire career. And I got started the day that Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. That was my, my first day. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, New Don't York City. Don't up, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. New York City, where we're based, I'm, I'm talking to you right now from my office in Tribeca, um, uh, is still a buyer's market. But the market in New York City, which was probably the worst it's ever been last summer, where we were doing deals at 50% off. We sold an apartment at 157 West 57. I represented the buyer. The seller paid 34 million. My buyer paid just under 17. And we also did deals where, you know, basically any seller in Manhattan in 2020 had to be prepared to take a loss. Now, there are more contracts signed in February in New York City than in any February since they started keeping records about contracts being signed, which predates 2000 which shows you that people are now starting to come back, which is what we always say. We know that in January, Douglas Elements show that rents are down 17% in New York City from last year. Home prices down 20%. You know, yeah. when do you think that it, it really is too late and we're back at pre-pandemic levels? I say too late for the buyers out there. If you're a buyer, you're looking at Manhattan. I think if you can make a decision now, 
um, uh, you will really, really thank yourself, and your future self will thank you. Uh, but you could probably still get a relatively good deal by the fall. I think in six months, we're gonna be having very different conversations in Manhattan. Because you have to remember, the rest of the country is in the hottest real estate market the country has ever experienced. Average days on market is six. Okay, there is no inventory. Really? Sellers, sellers don't know where to sell. They don't know where to go. You know, we have agents everywhere, and they're having a good time because they sell any house they have. But it's also difficult because transaction volume is starting to get less and less because sellers don't have a place to go. But in in luxury secondary markets, um, the sky is really the limit, and I don't see it coming down anytime soon. Uh, because well, where else are people going to go? Where else are they going to put their money? And real estate is, to most people, if you have the time, you have the patience, is always safe. It's only not safe if you must sell at any specific time. So let's talk a little bit about some of the big properties that have just uh, either been on the market or have actually sold. You've got Ellen DeGeneres. Uh, finally selling, but she, she flips and, and rehabs homes all the time. This has been a passion of hers. She's got one, her Beverly Hills home, $53.5 million. Uh, she is listing that at the moment. Yep. Uh, you look at something like a 50, who, who can buy $53 million houses? I mean, or maybe there are so many Bitcoin millionaires out there that they could do that. Then you got Jeffrey Epstein's former New York City mansion. That just sold for roughly $50 million. Uh, that has a little bit of a, a sort of a questionable provenance if people don't mind saying that, you know what, we, uh, we bought this place that this guy lived in. But tell me, tell me the sense that you're getting about the big, gigantic properties out there and how quickly they do move. Well, I mean, we just sold the second, I just sold the second most expensive home in the history of the United States in Florida, uh, in Palm Beach. It closed, uh, I guess it closed a couple weeks ago for um, just under $140 million. Um, and we sold it in one day. And what I'm seeing Wait, is that there is there is a section of wealthy who, purchasers. Who bought it? Can you say who bought it? It was a. It's public. I mean, you can look it up. Um, but it was a. Uh, there, there's a lot of finance executives um, who are out there who are looking to be in low tax states. Florida hasn't even seen the appreciation that we're going to be talking about in two, three years, because people are just being run out of New York. They're being run out of California uh, for making money. And so they're going to go to low tax states because COVID has taught them that they don't need to be in a high tax state every day to make their living. And I will tell you, the United States has still not, up until last year, it's still not fully recovered from 2008 when it comes to real estate. If you look at the numbers, most people still haven't really moved. They've only moved out of need. They had a baby. They're moving from a job. They're just getting too cramped, right? But all the speculative, exciting purchasing, really what fuels the stock market, right? Like, oh, I think I can make money there. Let me go buy that. Hasn't been active in the United States since 2007. And it now is back because 2020 was a, you know, what was what, six trillion dollar PR campaign for the value of residential housing. No one was told to stay under their desk. No one was told to stay in their car. And so housing got put on everyone's mind, including and especially yeah. the wealthy. And so they've been spending money because where else are they where, where, where else are they gonna buy? Where else are they gonna put their money into? Oh, chocolate for me, diamonds for me. <laughs> Ryan it's great. And they're buying those too and have record yourself. numbers. Indeed, indeed. Ryan Sirhan, he's got a brand new book out called Big Money Energy, How to Rule at Work, Dominate at Life, and Make Millions. Great to see you, Ryan. Ryan Sirhan of Million Dollar Listing New York. We are coming right back. Zone is sponsored by E-Trade. Trade commission free today with no account minimums. Fourteen minutes after the trading there, we're now in the closing bell market zone. Commercial pre-covering before they actually going into the close. 
CBC Senior Markets Commentator Mike Santo here to break down these crucial moments of the trading day. And today we've got ITAP Chief Investment Strategist Stephanie Link with us as well. Good afternoon to you, Stephanie. Let's kick things off with the broader markets. We are lower, but uh, off the lows, the Nasdaq's now down less than 2%, but uh, significant selling across the board today. Mike, what is the balance now between being oversold versus breaking below certain key levels of support? I don't think we're sort of broadly, comprehensively oversold to the point where you'd say this is a washed out market. I mean, we're down just 5% in the S&P 500. Um, you sort of challenge some of these technical levels. I think the bounce today uh, both made sense and could also be seen as a little bit too cute. You got to the exact 10% pullback in the NASDAQ 100. You got to the exact kind of year to date break even level in the S&P and then bounced. And, and so it makes sense, but I don't think that uh, it necessarily is very decisive. So if we're really looking for uh, you know, this welling up of, of fear and people having this sense of liquidation. We're not getting it, but nobody says you have to get that. 5% pullbacks happen. They kind of look like the first half of a 10% correction, but not all of them get there. Uh, and uh, the are not really showing any change in the macro outlook. It's much more uh, about discount rates, about what yields mean for valuation. And, uh, you know, growth stocks, high velocity growth stocks that have just broken stride. <coughs> Sure, but you know, the two factors that we're hoping to bull market run go in the other way, which is treasury yields and the U.S. dollar. So, does that make you rethink what you're doing, what you're buying? No, I mean, we'll take the points on the ten-year is a lot in five weeks' time. But let's keep it in perspective. At 154, I mean, that's still very manageable. Pre-pandemic, we were at two percent, and I think we've talked about this, Sarah. continue to see not only decent data, but it's broadening, it's broadening, and that's a good thing. I mean, this week alone, the market PMIs continue to stay in Chicago PMIs are up eight months in a row. U.S. factory orders are up nine months in a row. So we've talked about manufacturing and the renaissance there. It's happening. It's for real. I listen to a million different companies on the manufacturing side in the industrial part of the economy. And they say all good things. And it's only 12% of U.S. GDP, but for every one job created in, in, in the industrial manufacturing sector, so it's very, very important to see the manufacturing parts of the economy do well. Flip over to the consumer, which we know is 70% of the...
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so just so just one one stat. I mean, the core PCE, which is what the Fed looks at for inflation, it's at 1.5 percent. Yes, it's up from 0.9 percent back in April, but 1.5 percent is quite manageable. That's the number you really do want to watch, especially because going sure. forward in the next couple of months, but it, you are going to see easy comparisons, and it's going to rise. It's going to rise, but just watch it and watch the speed of it. Yeah, and inflation expectations are rising as well. We've got to hit Tesla shares, which have gotten hammered this week with the selling. Let's get to Phil above for more on the action in that stock. Phil. Brutal week for Tesla, Sarah. Okay. Go back to Tuesday. Really, really, really uh, depending on how it closes today. At one point, it was trading, I think, at $715, $718 a share, down basically $100 over the last three days. What's behind this? Well, you heard Mike talking about what's going on with these high multiple stocks. Look no further than Tesla if you are a believer that, hey, high multiple stocks, they should be under pressure. That's why Tesla is. And there's no catalyst for optimism. Right now, aside from your belief that Tesla Event. There's nothing you can hang your hat on if you're a Tesla bull right now, aside from the optimism that Elon Musk and his team will be the leaders down the road. And finally, EV stocks are strong, especially this week. Take a look at it. It's Tesla, it's Lordstown Motors, Fisker, Neo, and even the uh, the, te- the EV-related stocks. Take a look at Quantumscape. It's an example of another stock that's under pressure. So even though everybody within the auto industry, guys, will tell you EVs are the future. Let's be clear, they had a heck of a run over the last month, and it's not surprising that as the market goes under pressure, the EV stocks are going to become Mike, I mean, a lot of people point to the fact that if we close roughly where we are, or a little bit lower for Tesla, then from a chart perspective, there's not a lot of support for, for a while lower. The added problem, of course, for Tesla is you can't find much support on a P multiple basis right. for, for even further lower. Well, Remember, first of all, if you, the S&P 500 bought the stock at 695 when it went into the index. It's down more than 10% from those levels. So it went up so fast in that, in that month. That's why it seems like there could be this air pocket. More broadly, what's going on is the market is hunting for stocks that have a high story to substance ratio. It doesn't mean the story's wrong. It means it was too much reliance on the story. Not just EV, pretty much everything. If you want to look at software, a lot of that process is probably you know in the books already in terms of all that stuff getting called, and a lot of those uh, those stocks are down a ton uh, by now. So it's not as if it's the start of the process; it's it's underway. I think a lot of this. So is it looking cheap to you, Steph? Now at only 155 times the next year's forward earning. <laughs> you know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> play as well. I happen to own Active, which is also a, a quasi-EV play. That stock is down quite a bit as well. They have fundamentals, and they actually have earnings, and they have margin expansion and free cash flow. So those are all the characteristics I look for, and I really do like it. Yes, so that's great. the one I would buy on the weakness. Uh, well, there we go. There's a, there's a pullback option for you. Uh, shares of Snowflake, meanwhile, not pulling back today. Uh, after yesterday's earnings beat, uh, Snowflake CEO Frank Slootman on Squawk Alley earlier today talking about the company's growth going forward. Once you start unleashing all of that, that's uh, you know I, I see it as a as a positive for everybody in the economy, not not just, uh, not just us. So we're looking forward to just to just letting it rip, right, and really pursuing our opportunity with everything we've got. Mike, this one hasn't had the same level of build up over a sort of uh, medium uh, to long period of time like Tesla, but it had also been unbelievably successful and, and thus part of the kind of general pullback of late. Without a doubt, uh, yeah, stocks forty percent off its time. Uh, is, is already uh, you know gone some distance for being complete. 
Broadcom shares are also under pressure ahead of the chip makers' earnings after the bell. Josh Lipton with a preview of what we can expect. Josh. So, Sarah, heading into this report, Broadcom, like the rest of tech, you're right, it has been under some recent pressure, but we'll pack the chart there. It's still up more than 180% from its March low. Check in with Chris Rowland over at Susquehanna. He expects a modest beat and raise quarter here in port, given the strength, he says, from key customers like Apple. However, we know there is a historic chip shortage right now across the industry, and that says could limit upside. The big number to watch today, Q2 guidance. Chris is looking for 6.42 billion, but he says it probably has to be closer to 6.6 billion for the stock to move higher. Back to you all. Josh Lipton, Josh, thank you. Steph, what are your thoughts on Broadcom? Well, I own it. I like it. Um, it trades at about 20 times forward. You get a 3% dividend yield and you get cloud and you get data center and you do get 5G and, and Apple is a 20% is a customer or revenue base for the company. So they're going to see tailwinds for that as well. I think the biggest numbers I'm looking for right now are uh, bookings at 7 billion and back at 14 billion. The book to bill was north of one. So I do expect a strong quarter. It is all about the guide. And I actually think the guide might be a little bit better or a little less, a little less bad on a sequential basis because this is their seasonally slow quarter into next one. Mike, uh, as we approach the close, we haven't mentioned much the dollar. The dollar had a nice jump today uh, as well as yields. It did, actually. Dollar went up to a multi-month high, just largely in the U.S. dollar index anyway, and happened right as, as yields were popping after uh, Powell did speak. And I do think that's a little bit of a, of a challenge. It, it puts a little bit of a wrench in the works. I just think it, a lot of trades that are on heavily right now in this market are based on the premise of a continually weakening dollar. We pointed out the very negative positioning short dollar uh, right now. So it, it could upend uh, you know, some of these uh, some of these general macro trades that are out there. But uh, not really levels that you worry about, but just the fact that it did, uh, that it did pop. It was uh, a little bit of a stand-up in there this month. Didn't derail all, though. All is up 5% today, and that's why energy is the best-performing sector, the only positive sector on the S&P 500 as we approach the close of two minutes left. Mike, what are the internals showing? Uh, you know, not good, but maybe not as bad as you would think, depending on where you look. The New York Stock Exchange actually had positive Rev early in the day before you got that real selling wave hit. But you hear that one third, a little less than one third of all uh, volume in the New York is advancing volume. So about two thirds plus on the declining side of the NASDAQ. It's much, much more negative. In fact, look at the new highs versus new lows uh, on the NASDAQ right now. You have 322 new lows. That is a high for many, many months back. And then the fact that it's exceeding new highs, it just shows you the damage is piling up in tech, in growth, in biotech. Uh, and that's something we're probably going to have to get worked through uh, as we get through this corrective period there, even if we do uh, are seeing prime for a bounce. The volatility index, definitely some lift here. Remember, we never really crashed below 20, so uh, up around 28, 29. The VIX futures look like they're still in okay shape. In other words, just one of those things you would look for to say, is something breaking loose in the capital markets? Is there a lot of stress building up? There's a lot of mispositioning. So far, you're not really seeing it in the volatility index, even though it shows people certainly continue to be on it, Sarah. Less than a minute left of trading. The Dow is down 385 points. Boy, has it been a wild ride today. It's been a 900-point move as far as the Dow swing, from positive all the way deep negative, going down more than 700 points. After comments from Fed Chair Jay Powell suggested that they weren't prepared to intervene in the bond market and those higher yields. We saw yields take off into the 150s off those remarks. There's the S&P down almost 1.5%. Again, a lot better than it looked earlier in the afternoon, but every sector is lower right now except for energy. That's the standout. In fact, all the highs today are in the energy names, as well as Comcast, our parent company, also making a new high. Technology is the weakest link. Again, worst performing sector. The Nasdaq's down 2.2%, and that's going to take it negative for the year, down 1.35% year to date. All the other major averages are still higher. The Nasdaq, which was mm. the big star of 2020, is now lower with more pressure on technology That's amazing. as yields march higher. That's been the story, and it happened in a big way today, Wilfred. Off the session lows at the close, but Mark is going to the major averages. Welcome to the close of Bella Bonham, Wilfred Frost, along with Sarah Eisen, Mike Zampo, and CDC. I really thought we we're going to see something this close, but obviously it's at the open. It's crashing so hard tomorrow open.
essentially the focal point getting crushed again today. Coming up, we'll have a debate whether this tech wreck will continue. Uh, we'll be joined uh, by Tom Lee and Dan Ives. And we've got another big slate of earnings as well. Uh, and, um... Yeah, now I'm getting notifications that my YOLO game is strong. These, these are educated decisions. <laughs> okay, who's re reporting? Uh, Gap, Costco, Broadcom. Let's go ahead and pull up Bloomberg and see if we can get into uh, some of these, especially Costco. Costco, big COVID play. Costco had a nice skyrocketing during the pandemic. Let's go ahead and uh, punch in here. You know, I still, I have to say... When the last time we punched in on, well, not the last time, but who was here the day we punched in on the Bloomberg terminal and the security code it gave me, I tell you, this was like March 15th or something like this. It was between March 15th and March 10th. I'm sorry, between February 10th and February 15th. Uh, the security code it gave us was pray. Who was there for that? It literally had P-R-A-Y as the security code to log into the Bloomberg terminal. Folks, I mean, looking back, I should have listened to the damn thing. <laughs> that was freaking crazy. That was insane. And it was like, it was the gods telling us. And I remember looking at it like, oh, that's funny. <laughs> My God. Whoopsies. Oh, well. Shout out to those of you who are there. HC Aqua, <laughs> Elon Musk clips, Brent fans laughing out loud. Yeah. Oh, dear Lord. Okay, Bloomberg Terminal is coming up. Let's listen in for a moment while I pull up earnings for Costco. Stocks. So I think this is simply Wilfred, the economist and policy maker not understanding that their words are interpreted very differently in the marketplace. Uh -huh. It's a weird situation, Mohammed, because you've got Treasury yields rising, which in effect, it should be a good thing, right? We've been we've been expecting higher growth. We've been wanting higher growth. We needed to get out of the debt. You tell them, Sarah. And more jobs and more stimulus to help fight it. And so if Treasury yields are rising for the right reasons, and that's why stocks have been rising, why does it feel so ugly? And why does it feel like the, the market is pressing the Fed to do more? When Powell sits there and says, we're going to do as much as we can, and we're going to stay all in until we totally get through this. So this is really important. Um, it is a good thing that Treasury yields are going up for the right reason. And the right reason is that this economy is set to recover very strongly. And that's good for the stock market long term. The problem are the initial conditions. It's what you've heard me say for a long time, the massive disconnect between fundamentals and what have been liquidity-driven valuations. I was very struck by, by the words that Mike and Stephanie said. I agree with them. When they refer to, oh, it is those who have high story to substance are getting hit. It is those where the sentiment was the driver. It is. I, I've never heard that as a way to value a company. Is that we've had a massive disconnect. And what we are adjusting to is the fact that we cannot assume QE infinity. We cannot assume that interest rates will remain low forever. And that means that two things that have worked so well for stocks are under pressure. Tina, there was no alternative. Well, guess what? There is an alternative now. And then secondly, importantly, is what all the model-driven flows are, which is stocks because when discounted cash flows are what they are at very low interest rates, of course you buy stocks. And that's what's being challenged. Mike, uh, we've we mentioned... Yeah, 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 yeah. This is like this is like uh, uh, this is like when we when, when we fall at the jungle gym as a child, and Daddy comes over and goes, "I told you not to rely on the rubber that's on the floor. You still end up getting hurt. I told you you're going to get hurt." Well, Daddy, did you know that if I practice my agility on this gym, I could be somebody someday? In other words. Long Tesla. Thank you very much. Okay, moving back over. So we've got the news coming up for Costco uh, earnings coming up here. No news yet on these three. We got Gap, Broadcom, Costco reporting today. Uh, I will verify that, but giddy up. We got earnings coming up. Oh, crap. I turned the audio off. Wait, giddy up. We got earnings coming up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, while we wait for these earnings uh, coming up, we can go ahead and look at the sticks in the after hours, which we have not done yet. Uh, so this should be entertaining. Let's go ahead and drag our after hours change over here. 
Yeah, we could leave those. Okay, we'll pull our charts over. So, cool, we got our tickers, our names, and after hours. So, in after hours, we've got Okta coming back, Enface coming back, and uh, Etsy coming back. And by coming back, I mean, like, giving us up a... Uh, uh, oh, sends? Okay, let's pull them up. And by, by coming up, I mean, like, half percent. <laughs> so, I, I hear a lot of uh, talk about sends earnings. Somebody says 430. Well, we can pull them up. Uh, let's see here. Sends? Okay, cool. We do not have results from any of these yet. Any other earnings I'm missing? What's IMMR? I have no idea, but you're asking about it, so why not bring it up? Immersion Corp. Uh, core, Corp, whatever. Uh, corporation, Core, like a press core. Who knows? Uh, okay, so, yep, no earnings yet on any of these. So, okay, sends up after hours. Oh, let's see what's going on. Insider trading, insider trading, sends, insider trading, look at this, look at this, run. I mean, it, it could just be that people looked at the earnings calendar and they're like, I think it's going to go up. That's possible. Kevin, look at SLGG, oh, I have seen that. Is that reporting today or, or are we just looking at the chart on it? I don't even know what that is. I'll look at it though. So let's do that, SLGG. Superior League Gaming. Is that right? Is that the right ticker symbol? I have no idea. I actually forgot to look at the ticker symbol. I just clicked on it. Uh, Superior League Gaming. I don't know if they are. Surges 36% pre-market after gains. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I see. Usually these come into popularity when they have a big run. SL. Somebody said GG, right? Like good game? Uh, SLGG. Yeah, there it is. Okay, that's up 5%. That actually moved today. Yeah? Wow. Yeah, look at that big pre-market bump. That's crazy. Wait, where was it? Oh, I thought I saw it. Oh, it's just a little laggy. Here, let's go back today. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Sudden run over here at uh, this one. Going from about $2.90 to $9 in like three days. This thing tripled. Wow. Fancy. Yeah, that is something to look into. Not, not saying I want to buy it after a crazy run like that, but something to look into. Uh-oh, we got earnings on sends. Here we go. Somebody's fast. It's crazy. Here we go. Okay, uh, fourth quarter, loss of 41 cents. Revenue of $3.9 million. And uh, somebody actually just posted this thank you for that since total revenue for the quarter was 3.9 million compared to 9 million for the fourth quarter of 20 oh uh that doesn't sound good u.s revenue was 0.4 mil and revenue outside the u.s was 3.5 mil wow compared so that's very very low revenue it, it, okay interesting so it sees 12 to 15 million in revenue in 2021 okay let's see how the stock is reacting I mean, it's up. It's up on this news. That's crazy. What's, up? What's the market cap of this thing? I mean, a few million dollars in revenue. And uh, there's so much excitement over this. Fascinating. Let's look at everything else really quick. While we wait for some of these other earnings. Clover on its return here. Clover also running in the after hours. Clever Leaf, cannabis company running in the after hours. Open door up 4%. Canoe up 3%. Here we go. Now we're starting to see some gains here in the after hours. What's losing in the after hours? Uh, you got Social Capital, Beyond Me, Win, Moderna, Wayfair leading some losses here. Everything else pretty flat right now in the after hours. Let's take a peek at how Neo ended and Tesla. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got Neo flat at $39. What is happening? Oh my gosh, it's so cheap. Tesla. Let's see here. Tesla at $621. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, let's go to the Bloomberg terminal here. Uh, here we go. Sends earnings. Yep. Yeah, okay, thank you for whoever posted that. You were pretty dang quick on that. Uh, futures will open up in about two hours. So let's see uh, for whoever was asking that. Okay, immersion. Okay, so no updates yet on these guys. Costco has not released yet either. Let's see what um, Mr. V-shaped recovery has to say. 
Let's listen to V-shaped recovery here. Strong, what you call strong anti-masking language. I had Why? some discussions. Why? Fox Business, you guys kill me. Every, like the market's been crashing all day long. And you're talking about Cuomo and masking. Oh my God, what kind of business channel is this? Stop. Oh, Larry, what have you done? Oh, sorry. Um, certain tools that they're thinking about, the marketplace would have wanted him to accelerate implementation. I tell you, the best approach would have been to say nothing at all. But he tried to strike that balance, and it's very hard. I don't think anybody could have struck it, actually. It's really tricky. I go back to Steph's notion. It is a lose-lose situation right now. <laughs> and a greedy market. Mohamed Alarian, thank you. Great to have you here on a day. Oh, we just got uh, earnings from Open Door. Thank you for whoever mentioned that. Open Door. This could also move Redfin and Zillow. Open Door announces fourth quarter. We got 49 cents a share or loss. Loss of 87 million. Revenue of 248. Uh, sees revenue in quarter one of 600 to 625 million. How? What? Their fourth quarter revenue? because It's because of springtime and real estate? How do you go from 248.9 mil? Oh, I think it's probably because uh, you've got uh, you got maybe a bunch of people, uh, you know, who have a lot of open door properties that are maybe getting fixed up. And uh, maybe they're going to dump those in the spring is the theory. Maybe. Maybe that is the theory. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if we all give Kevin five dollars, he can get more Tesla. Oh, no. Somebody says I look tired. Do you go up to a soldier in the battlefield and tell them they look tired? We're not sissy-handed people walking off the battlefield. We keep fighting. Okay, let's see what Open Door is doing. <laughs> open, open, Open Door, 4.9. Okay, so it's it's up on this news. Uh, so it sends up about 8%, but it's giving up a little bit of that. Uh, let's see... Uh, okay, so I want to get some more data from Open Door here. Thank you for whoever called that out is coming up with an earnings. Uh, Sens, we got a little bit more here from Sens. They, uh, and it has an EPS loss of 41 cents versus 18 cent year over year. Okay, what was the estimate? Okay, the estimated revenue actually beat substantially here. Oh, that's good. That's good. Uh, yeah, troops don't sleep. That's right. <laughs> uh, going back to open door earnings here, we've got no new update here on the terminal, so we'll keep an eye on this. Mm, okay, let's look at sense here again. Uh, chart of net rev versus estimates. Let's see here. Okay, here we go. So blue must have been estimates. Yeah, blue was estimates, and this is where uh, the revenue actually came in. So they had a big miss in Q2, but uh, big, big run over here. Uh, or, or beats over here. What are we talking about on earnings here? 7 million analysts anticipated I'm earnings, at. though, missing estimates by a penny with a loss of 21 cents per share. The company saying... I haven't been to an IMAX theater since, like, fifth grade. Am I missing something? Local language releases recorded robust box office, which they say were at near pre-pandemic levels. They also announced that they've installed 33 systems and signed 11 agreements in the fourth quarter. They are enthusiastic, Wilf, about the box office and audiences returning. Okay, IMAX up 4% after hours, of course, after a negative day uh, of trade in the uh, actual session. Let's flip it back to the broad markets, to the tech sector in particular. Uh, the Nasdaq leading the decline today, as we've uh, been discussing, down 2.1%. Joining us to discuss uh, where from here, Dan Ives of Webbush Securities, Tom Lee, head of I, research. People, people make fun of CNBC, but at least they're talking about the market. Let's check it, Fox. Let's see if they moved over. Of course, it's a commercial. Uh, well, from masks to commercial. Thanks, Fox. Okay, so NGA selling off about 3.14%. We got a red candlestick here.
digital DocuSign and Zscaler, for which redefining digital transformation in terms of cloud with its cybersecurity. I can tell you the conversations I've had over the last 48 hours, investors are going to wait for this period, and they're going to buy two hands full, because to me, that's really what's going to lead to tech higher. It's not just about cybersecurity, it's saying names, and we view this as just the middle of what's going to be a tech bull cycle. Dan and Tom, we've got to leave it there to opposing views on tech. We appreciate it. And we'll stick with the technology beat because Broadcom earnings are just out. Josh Lipton with those numbers. Josh. So Sarah, Broadcom reporting Q1 results here. Uh, EPS $6.61, that's versus expectations of $6.55. Uh, revenue coming in at $6.66 million, she was at $6.62 million. And for Q2, they say they're looking for a back $6.5 million. Uh, analysts and bottom closer to $6.3 billion. Digging into segments of <clears throat> solutions, $4.91 billion in the quarter. And infrastructure software clocks in at $1.75 billion. Uh, CEO Hawk Tan here saying we execute well through our first fiscal quarter driving 14% organic growth year on year. This growth, he says, reflects the critical role our technology franchises play uh, in this environment of accelerated digital transformation. Conference calls at 5 p.m. Eastern. Back to you all. And the stock is unch unchanged. Josh, thanks. Up next, former Goldman Sachs CFO Marty Chavez on today's huge sell-off and Walmart's banking ambitions after it lured away a pair of Goldman Sachs executives. Plus, Mike Santoli breaking down the sentiment showdown on Wall Street and whether the bulls can win back momentum in this market after another tough day of selling for them. And as we had to break, a look at today's biggest losers in the Dow. Um, well, I guess we wait till tomorrow.